self-determination for our children? How do we want our schools to look like? In Illinois, there are 891, 92 school districts. Chicago has never had an elected school board, but all the other ones to have those. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. And it's something that we shouldn't still be have, have to fight for in the year 2020. It's, it seemed like it's a no brainer that, you know, we, it, we just, we should have it like everyone else, uh, like Centralia, Illinois, Shiloh, uh, Danville, you know, my home city, East St. Louis, uh, Decatur, Springfield, all these other cities in this Rockford in the state of Illinois have the opportunity to elect the people who are gonna help make the decisions for their school district, except for Chicago. Now, many of us have had a lot of different um, um, instances, campaigns, fights around school closures. And you know, in the mid 2000s, we were fighting against school closures. So it was like, we need voice, we need voice. And we would go out there and, they, and the school board wouldn't listen to us and still close our schools. Then they come up with a process. Okay, we got to have this process now where you got to have so many hearings and this, that, and the other. We follow that. And what happened? They still close our schools, still don't listen to us. So it's like we have been following this thing, but the thing we're missing is the power. We're missing that, that element of democracy, of us being able to choose the people who represent us, the school board who makes the decision, so that if we select someone who is bad for our schools, guess what? In two to four years, we can do what? We can elect someone else new. But right now, we don't have that power. Our, our school board right now is beholden to the people that give them their position, and that's the mayor. And so we're saying that we've had countless referendums, countless. Uh, we have had many politicians run on uh, having an elected school board. We've passed it in the House a couple of times. We passed it in the Senate once or twice. And yet and still, it's 2020, and we don't have an elected school board. So that's why we're here tonight. So I do want to make sure, just a little bit of background, but also just remind some of us all the issues we have with the schools. You know, if it's remote learning, if it's going back to school, if it's having cops in school, if it's school closures in the past, whatever it is, a lot of those decisions fall back on the school board and our inability to be able to select those who represent us and who raise our taxes on this thing. We've even filed lawsuits, um, um, Title VI complaints, you know, civil rights lawsuits around elected school board, and we still don't have elected school board. So with that, we're going to bring up State Senator Robert Martin to talk to us, one, about the bill we do have. Uh, HB 2267 and where it's at and what we can do on that. Thank you. There we go. Just had to unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much, Rod. Can you everybody hear me? I kind of get it. There we go. Thumbs up. Okay, good. I see G2 nodding over there. Um, and uh, so thank you everyone for allowing me to be here and to join you again today. Um, it's always an honor to be with you, um, especially those of you who have been in this fight a lot longer than I have. Um, it has been an honor to carry your legislation and to fight for it in the General Assembly. Um, uh, Rod, as you mentioned, this bill uh, in the form that it's in, um, almost almost entirely in the form that it is in, has passed the House of Representatives three times, three times, I think. Kurt will correct me if I'm wrong on that, maybe a fourth time. Um, and it passed the Senate once, but never at the same time. And now we're, we're in a place where um, we, we could be ready to, to pass that bill. Um, it's teed up, it's in the Senate. And um, so I was the sponsor in the House this year when we passed it in the House with 110 votes. And it crossed over to the Senate, where I am now the sponsor in the Senate. Um, I picked up my own bill when I moved over as the bill came over. And um, I have uh, made it very clear to the new Senate president, President Harmon, 
that this bill is my single legislative priority that is that I really hope that he will attend to. Um, and, and so um, I feel very good about it. Um, we are planning on meeting in the January session in um, uh, what we call lame duck session, which is the, gen the session of the General Assembly right before um, the, the General Assembly adjourns. And then we swear in the new newly elected members on January 13th. So the hope is that we will get the bill and, and bring it for a vote in the Senate and get it across the finish line and get it to the desk of the governor before, uh, before the General Assembly adjourns. So that, that's our hope. Um, I, I wanna, um, again, thank you all for all the work that you've done. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that session. This is something that was supposed to be done in the regular session, but then of course COVID got in the way of that. And then it was gonna be taken up in veto. And of course, COVID got in the way of that. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. We have a plan for a lame duck session and hopefully the transmission rates stay at a point where yes, where we can, we can meet and get this done. So um, that, that's my plan. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about the specifics of the bill. So let me know what, what you need from me, Rod. So Senator Marvel, could you just give us some basic uh -oh, provisions within Hold the on. bill? Go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rod. Uh, can you give us some basic provisions with, within the bill? What, is, what does the bill actually do? Yes, so what the bill would do is, um, <laughs> first and foremost, it would give Chicago an elected representative school board. Yes, and um, so um, when I first took up this cause, um, there were a number of concerns that were brought to me. And those concerns were primarily, um, you know, from very different people, whether it was advocates, uh, on behalf of an elected school board um, or people who are just concerned about what this change would amount to. And so th th I would say the three of the bigger concerns that were brought up um, were number one, um, ensuring that it was not just an elected school board, but an elected representative school board. Um, Chicago is an incredibly diverse city and we needed to ensure that the school board was reflective of the diversity of the city, reflective of uh, the diversity of, of the school system and, and, and made sure that, that everyone had access to this. So that, um, and, and, and that, you know, that was a, 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 a real big concern was making sure that this had, was truly representative of the population of Chicago and, and the unique neighborhoods. Secondly, was the concern of outside money, right? What will happen if we, turn into an elected school board, how do we limit the influence of outside money? And, and one of the uh, bad examples of this was what they did in Los Angeles. Um, when they switched to an elected school board, literally the Koch brothers, the conservative Koch brothers, came in and spent millions of dollars on each and every seat. And they won every single seat on their Los Angeles, newly elected Los Angeles school board. So, you know, we want to make sure that we have an elected school board to give people democracy. We don't want that democracy corrupted by the influence of outside money. And finally, the last thing was to ensure that, you know, there's a lot of elections on the ballot and people say, well, what if this is like judges where people go in and they don't educate themselves and they make bad choices and they just play a name game. How do we ensure that voters at least have access to education on these issues? And so that's those three things primarily drove the structure that I came up with. Um, so the structure is in a nutshell, 20 represent school board representatives that would be elected from individually drawn representative districts. This would allow uh, neighborhoods, each district would be roughly the size of a state representative district. So if that gives you any guidance, about 100,000 people. Um, so this would, you'd be able to cobble together six or seven schools in a certain area and, and you could, you know, this would ensure that that people from every part of the city and, and uh, of every uh, ethnic and, and racial background have access to be elected to represent their neighborhoods and their schools. And then what it would also do is by by drawing districts, you limit the influence of outside money. So I talked about Los Angeles. Los Angeles went from seven member school board uh, appointed school board to a seven member elected school board and they elected all of those members at large. 
meaning everyone in the city voted for them. And that running a, a citywide election is so terribly expensive, which is why the Koch brothers were said, money, we got lots of money. And they bought up all of the seats. By drawing into the smaller districts, which is why I chose 20, it, you're able to ensure at least that you can limit the uh, in, influence, uh, influence of outside money. I served seven years in the House, and I will tell you that in a House of Representatives districts, your grassroots organization, your participation in your community and your activism is more important than the money. And so that's why I chose that 20 members. Finally, one school board president would run citywide. And what this would do was this would draw major media attention to the race of school board president, much like perhaps our aldermen maybe don't get all that much press coverage, but we can judge our aldermen because we're educated about the issues that the city faces because of the mayoral race. And so it's a way of providing education and drawing attention to the school board races so they get uh, what they need so that constituents can somewhat be informed. So that's the structure of the board. 20 members elected from representative districts that would be drawn by the General Assembly, one elected school board president that would be elected uh, citywide. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. That. So if people have uh, questions later, we can um, we can take questions later, but we wanna make sure we keep moving through. Uh, Absolutely. I, and thank you, uh, Senator Marwick. Uh, I do wanna say a couple of things. One, um, that the bill before you is a bill that we've worked on for years. Um, the first iteration of that was around 2011, 20, I, I know GT is gonna go more into more of the history, but I just wanna make sure if someone says, well, that's Martwick's bill, that's not Martwick's bill. That's a bill we've been working on for a long time. And we put a lot of sweat equity in this. So we can't have, let no one else say it, it's not ours. You know, we put a lot of work into this and we, this is something we've been fighting for. And, and we will say this, it ain't perfect. It ain't perfect. And there is no panacea to, you know, just correcting our schools. But this does empower us to have more control over our schools. So it, it again, it ain't gonna, you know, you know, be a magic wand, but it does give us more say. It does give us some decision-making about who represents us and who makes those decisions for us. And I think that's what we're fighting for, that democracy. So I uh, just want to make those points because, you know, because some people may say, well, you know, Marwick, you know, this is his bill and why should we No, This ain't about Marwick. This ain't about, no, no offense now. You've done, you done a yeaman's job on, you know, getting it out the house and everything. So I'm not taking anything from you. Don't get me wrong. But this is about the folks who, you know, in 2012 ran those, uh, those referendums at first when they were very unpopular. You know, and again in 2015 and 16, knocking on doors, this is about, those people who in, in in our neighborhoods who for, who fought for this. So on, on that note, I want to bring up Mr. G2 Brown, um, Journey for Justice um, Alliance director, um, one of the greatest MCs I've ever known, um, my teacher in local school council work, like the school board work, and just how to work with youth in general, my brother, Mr. G2 Brown. You want to get some accolades, brother? Okay. H2 <laughs> and Senator Mark, it was good to see you with your coronavirus beard. I'm glad you, you're you hanging in there, man. And um, again, good to see you and, and thank you for championing this for us. We appreciate it. So I'm, I'm not going to be long. I'm going to try to be strong. I want to respect everybody's time. As you know, it's been said before, this is not a new fight. Um, the fight for democracy and public education is important because Chicago's never had an elected representative school board. Um, before 1995, what Chicago had, slow down, man. What Chicago had before 1995 was um, a trustee system where aldermen got to make recommendations to the school, to, uh, to the mayor, and then they appointed school board members that way. Uh, they picked from a poll that came from different aldermen. That still was not democracy. And as we know, Chicago was still highly inequitable. Um, when I was in first grade, I actually went to school in the Willis wagons. So the history of, of racism and segregation in Chicago public schools 
is uh, has a long legacy. And for anybody that's on the line that may be part of local school councils, it's important to understand uh, me and Rod have a long history with LSCs. Um, I've been a trainer of local school councils since 1999. I sat on Diet High School's local school council for 10 years. And the reason why democracy is important, so when you hear the mayor, or when you hear Janice Jackson, or when you hear some other politician say, well, you have a voice, you have local school councils. When I was on the local school council at Diet High School, we would come up with great ideas, but then it would be sabotaged from up top. Whether that up top is budget cuts, whether that up top is another school closing and your school becoming a receiving school for school closings, your school being on probation and being mandated to spend things that you know your children didn't need. Democracy has to flow. There can't be a, a place where democracy is cut off by bureaucracy. And so um, we wanna talk a little bit about the history. So let's go to the next slide. So we understand, as Rod said earlier, that Chicago is the only city in the state of Illinois out of, 100, uh, out of 892 school boards with no elected school board. I want to say this real quick. Um, and we know that most school, uh, there are a lot of major school districts uh, that have elected school boards, that we started to see the expansion of um, mayoral control and state takeovers as the demand from the federal government and from the privatization movement to close schools, expand charters, began to grow. They had to get rid of any type of resistance to that particular agenda. And so that's how we've seen appointed school boards grow. That not having an elected school board and it have, having it be so race based. In other words, the only cities that have appointed school boards are state takeovers. With the exception of Montclair, New Jersey, every other city in the United States has primarily brown and black students. We understand that as voter suppression. That is voter suppression because these people can raise our taxes. So that's why as we began to organize as early as 2006, we began to fight uh, for democracy at this level. Again, democracy is not a panacea. We can go to the next slide, but it is a necessary ingredient. Why do we need an elected representative school board? And again, we began to do this as early as 2006. Um, as early as 2006, groups of community organizations um, and, and, and uh, teacher caucuses began to do petitions at the Bud Billiken Day Parade, trying to get people to demand democracy. Um, we know that what has come from this particular practice has not been improved students' achievement, but it has been the expansion of school closings, turnarounds, consolidations, charter expansions, corruption, uh, all types of things that came from having a body of people who are accountable to the mayor and the corporate interests that move him or her, as opposed to what our children need that has been identified by parents, by young people, by teachers, by people in communities. We can keep it moving. And so again, the result of this practice has been over one quarter of the district schools have been given over to private operators. And we know that since 2002, only 18% of the schools, I'm gonna try to hit this, since 2002, only 18% of the schools that have replaced school, uh, closed schools perform well. And out of that 18%, half of those are selected enrollment. Let's try to hear me. So they batting less than 20%. So if you were a quarterback and you only completed one out of five of your passes, would you keep your job? If you were a baseball player and you only got a hit once every five times at bat, would you stay in the lineup? But this particular approach to education for brown and black children is okay when they're only batting a, a, a less than 20%. Um, and having an unelected school board creates conditions like this. How many of you all have been to school board meetings and had parents pleading, young people pleading 
with the school board to say, please don't close my school. Young people drawing pictures and, 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 and trying to convince a body of people who aren't even listening to them that our school is not a failed school. Our school, we're doing this, we have relationships and time after time, at the time, at the time, the result is to ignore those voices and to move an agenda where they did there really didn't need to be a hearing in the first place because the agenda was already set. So unelected school boards routinely ignore the will of students, teachers, and parents. Let's keep it moving. So Chicago was the second big city in the United States to go after mayoral control. Again, mayoral control says that the mayor appoints the school board and appoints the superintendent. And in most cases, that superintendent becomes a CEO, which means that superintendent does not have to be qualified. They don't have to be more qualified than the principal in order to be the chief education leader in, in the particular school district. So the first place to have mayoral control was uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And then Chicago was second. Now, in 1995, the Illinois General Assembly gave control of CPS to the mayor after five straight years of improved test scores on the Iowa test of basic skills. So basically the mayor at that time daily invented an education crisis. And then from messaging that education crisis said, we've got to do something. And to do something means give me full control. And what has happened as a result is that in order to be heard, parents and communities have had to go through to really extenuating means in order to, to have their voices heard. Parents in Little Village, along with parents in Bronzeville, had to go on hunger strikes, hunger strikes, to win neighborhood schools. Um, the, the education of thousands of children have been interrupted. They're children that they can't even find at the school closings. Children whose IEP is not getting met. System, like as culture within Chicago public schools. So we know that having an elected representative school board gives us a real chance to push for equity. Now I know you may hear Janice Jackson talk about equity now, but I wanna say this to you. And you might hear Mayor Lloyd Life to talk about equity, but the, the metrics for equity can never come from the seats of privilege, never. The, met, the metric from equity must come from those that have the least. Those that are closest to the pain must be closest to the power. I don't care what anybody tells you. If you keep those principles in mind, then you'll never get it twisted. That, so when Mayor Leifert says that an elected school board is about white men like Senator Martwick trying to tell black people what to do with their schools, don't or black and brown people what to do with their schools, don't drink that Kool-Aid. Because as Rod said, the demand for an elected representative school board came from the hood. It came from our neighborhood. It came from parents that were sick and tired of not having a voice, right? And Markwin, as his, Senator Markwin has been one of the people that have been decent enough to take this on as a fight. I don't care if you're black, white, blue, or brown. What we care about is your value system, your belief system. So, so no, this demand comes from us. It comes from the neighborhoods. So I just want to make that point. The history of the taking away of our voices has been to accomplish what we see happening in the city of Chicago now. 20 years of school closings. Matter of fact, every city in the United States, every city in the United States where the charter industry has taken root the black population has gone down. Chicago, we are down to 31% African-American in the year 2000, we were 53%. Washington DC has gone from 70 over 70% chocolate city to a little less than 50%. We can go on and on and on. And the, one of the common links is the removal of democracy and the privatization of education. Kill the institutions, the people leave. Let's keep moving. And as we said before, uh, I was part of an effort in 2015, where in order to save the last open enrollment high school in our community, despite developing a world-class proposal, despite having the voices of thousands of people in Bronzeville fully in support, the mayor of this city cared so little about the voices of our community that we were pushed to starve our bodies for 34 days. 
And I'll never forget that experience as long as I live. That experience showed me what hatred looks like. It showed me what disregard looks like. And so, but I know that that situation is was just a a a um and really a national expression of what parents go through every day in a school system that does not value the voices of our communities because they don't have to listen to them. But if they have to if they have to get voted in office, they have to listen. Let's keep moving. So as far back as 2011, uh, Brother Rod Wilson, myself, Mark Kaplan from uh, uh, Northside uh, Action for Justice and other freedom fighters formed a group called Communities Organized for Democracy and Education, CODE. And CODE was, was, was put together specifically to fight for an elected representative school board. Let's move to the next one. And so the first thing we did is we did a referendum in over 35 precincts, uh, over 300 precincts throughout the city of Chicago. And, it was, and that was in 2012. And the results of that referendum were, next slide, over 87% of Chicagoans who voted, voted yes for an elected representative school board. We did a second referendum in the fall of 2015. And guess what? Almost 90% of the voters in 37 of 50 wards said yes for an elected representative school board. The mayor of this city the, and the candidate who ran for mayor of the city, both of them ran saying they wanted an elected school board. But let's move to the next slide. But today we have the mayor of this city calling for a hybrid, a hybrid. And believe it or not, we knew that's what Rahm Emanuel was pushing for. I want to make the connection. We knew that Rahm Emanuel in 2014, that the furthest he was willing to go was a hybrid school board. A hybrid school board is a creation by the privatization interest. It comes from the Eli Broad Institute that says that this is how you get away from democracy. So you're gonna give, give them four elected seats, you have six appointed seats. That's still mayoral control. We don't, have a high, we don't have a hybrid city council. We don't have a hybrid state legislature and we sure in the hell don't need a hybrid school board. We need full democracy. So in 2016, I want y'all to, um, to check the technique as we flow. In 2016, we, we, we passed House Bill 0557 out of the House, passed 110 to 4, was killed by Senator Cullerton and, Mayor, and former Mayor Rahm Emanuel, right? Uh, and as you see the composition, it's a total of 21 members, all elected, 20 sub-districts, one member elected at large. And the reason why we have 20 sub-districts is because it, by regional, by having regional seats, in other words, board members having to represent certain regions, what it does is it, it lowers the possibility of private interest being able to pump money into the election because people are representing smaller areas. Um, and so that means that regular people have the opportunity to run competitive races. Um, we can move to the next slide. 2017, the House passed House Bill 1774. And once again, Cullerton, uh, uh, former Senate President Cullerton and former Mayor Rahm Emanuel killed the bill. So where we are now um, is that House Bill 2267 uh, has passed 110 to two and life had derailed the bill but the bill is still alive. So what has happened is that the demand for equity, demand for racial justice has um, bubbled to the surface. And so there's an opportunity in January to make sure that this bill passed the Senate and Representative Martwick is now State Senator Martwick. So he is in the he is in the chamber that he needs to move in order to make this pass, but he cannot do this himself. So when people say, what can we do? We're asking people to call your Senate, to call uh, Dan Harmon, because the fight for an elected representative school board, we have been arrested. We have occupied locations. We have gone to Senator Cullerton's house. We have taken over his bar. We have done everything we need to do. And people should not have to work this hard in a democracy for democracy, right? Why do they resist democracy? Why are they against the voices of our, of our communities being heard? 
These are the things that we need to understand. And never forget this. Nobody will love your children more than you. So if somebody does not want your voice at the decision-making table, they are not in your interest. If they do not want your voice at the decision-making table, they are not in your interest. And we're going to do a little street talking right now. We, You know, back in the day, when, when I used to go to Maxwell Street, they had hustlers back in the day. And the hustlers would have, they open a jacket and inside their jacket, they have watches and gold chains and all this other stuff. And I remember one guy got me because he had this big, thick gold chain. And so he told me that he had just stole this from Marshall Fields. I was only like 13 years old. He said he stole this from Marshall Fields. So I go and I buy the chain. And of course, in two days, the chain turns green. What he did is the same thing is what people who are against an electric school board is going to do. They're going to talk blase, blase. And I want y'all to let that settle. Blase, blase. Blase, blase just means a whole bunch of talking and not saying nothing. At the end of the day, if somebody does not want your voice at the decision-making table, they are not in your interest, especially when it's your children, especially when it's your community. So we now have the opportunity in January 2021 for the Senate to meet for lame duck and we have to pass House Bill 2267. So we need people to make this a priority. We need people to dig deep and fight this fight. And I wanna make a quick announcement. And then I, I, you know, I'm honored to be a part of this coalition. People will always tell you what you can't win. People told us we could not stop Mercy Hospital from closing. And the first time in history today, the Illinois Health Facilities Board voted unanimously to refuse the closure of a hospital. Community organizing works. Community organizing works. And that's what we have to understand. We have to understand that the only way we're going to get this is if we fight for it, right? We shouldn't have to fight for it, but that's how we're going to win it. So hopefully, I think that's uh, that's about all I got. I told y'all I wouldn't be there. I wasn't too long, was it, Brother Rod? Nah, but that's right on point, but right on point. As right on point. That's Gratitude. Tough. All right. So with that, um, so G2 gave us a new word and it was a hybrid board. So beware of that. So when, cause let's back up. Mayor Lightfoot ran on, Lightfoot ran on a platform of supporting like the school board, but has not said one thing about that since she's been in office. Has not pushed the you know, state legislators on this at all. Not at all. I'm not putting any any political capital behind it at all. And when she begins to talk about a hybrid board, note that that's a play out of Rahm Emanuel's playbook. No different. It's about acting is acting like they want what we want, but really not want to lose control. So don't get so. Let's when she start talking about like Rahm Emanuel, we need to call it for what it is. But we do not support a hybrid. We don't. Well, why should we have to get some appointed board members, and no one else has to do that? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. So don't forget that because it's going to come up, and people are going to say, you know, she's going to be saying, hey, you know, well, this is the way to keep big money out of it. If I control, no, that's bull. That's bull. That's just a way for her to try to keep control of this board, and we got to call it out for what it is. Now, right now, we're the closest we've been in a while on this. All we have to do is get the Senate to vote for it. That's it. That's all we have to do. It won't, and, and we just got to make sure we get that due process. So we're going to go into more of what we need to do next. But first, we got a few people who are going to come up and just talk about, you know, their experiences and why we need an elected school board. First, I'm going to bring up a sister who's dear to my heart who, you know, Every time I see you, you just bring peace to my heart. I really do. Miss Irene Robertson from Coco. Uh, Miss Irene, are you ready? Yes, thank you, my brother Rob. Yes, um, it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, um, thanks for everyone for coming out. Uh, we really do need elected representative school board, like right now, because through the part of, due to the inequity of our education system the school board along with the mayor have uh, they have created policies that come to become hate crimes in our community 
in our black community. And I'll tell you why, in 2013, Ron Emanuel, along with his appointed board, decided to not invest in our schools, but to close 50 schools. That was an attack on black children in our community to the point where after closing, those, when they closed in those schools, they opened up 50 charter schools. They invested millions in other uh, private selected enrollment schools. And the only thing that they could offer us is an eviction notice. We fought the parents at Overton along with Madison. We fought. We went to those um, um, meetings. Our voices what was not heard. I have never been to jail until I start asking questions is why we don't have resources at Overton anymore. Why there's no books, why there are no social workers, nothing but a, 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 fit, a fit get out, right? So after we lost that school, we continue to fight. But the disparate, when you close schools, you kill children dreams. Is almost stopping a lifeline. They cannot, and education should do no harm to our children, but it has done many harm. And no one is accountable for what Ron Emanuel and his appointed board did in 2013. To the point that when we, after all that, I look up, they after our last open enrollment school, Gree have no limit, no limit. So once again, we, I thank God for the Kenwood Opening Community Organization because at that time, I don't know where I would have been if they wouldn't have came to help us fight through that process. And that's where I met Brother G2, um, Alderman Jeanette Taylor and everyone else. But that little group helped me to understand. And at, I have to say Jay Travis, because she had been a champion for fighting for elected representative school board when I didn't even know how important it meant to have one. So if they sit, so once in 2015, when they closed diet, we had to fight. We had 13 young people in that building. Let me show you how they did our black children in that building. They were not allowed to, to use none but a small portion of that building. And they was taking gym on land and they had been threatened to go to another school. Most of the CPS had told most of the parents at Diet that they had to leave, put their child in somewhere else. We need someone who cares about our children, who love them, who would inspire them with information so that they could thrive and be what they want. Closing schools is a hate crime in multiple ways. It push out teachers, it's take away resources, it is take away um, program to the point where we don't have school, we have many jail cells. Our, our children is hurting from the impact of school closing, privatizing our school. That create chaos in our community. And it leaves an example that black lives don't matter. Now we are forcing in, they closing our hospital. No, we need, they, Janet Jackson need to remove herself along with the whole appointed school board and Laura Lightfoot was at meetings when we was at. She, she ran off elected representative school board, and that's what we want. And I tell all parents, these are our babies. These are our children. Just like Brother G2 say, no one gonna love them like we love them. They took the funding, they stole our school, and a lot of our children had died on, on behind of the actions that they created. Them, I talk to parents every day. This has been devastated and no one be held accountable for it. Janet Jackson kids is not experiencing going to a school, hers in private. 
They have everything. So why would they sit on that board and destroy our children, but they won't destroy theirs? We need somebody on there who's gonna love every child and make sure they have a world-class education and equitable school system. And that's what we need. We can, I'm like, enough is enough. And we won't take it no more. All right. Thank you, Miss Irene. I appreciate that. You know, hey, it's simple and plain. It's simple and plain. If it ain't simple, it ain't the truth. I appreciate that, sister. So Thank next you. week, we're going to bring up a Miracle Boy, a powerhouse in the city. Miss Miracle, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. There you go, sister. It's all yours. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Miracle here. I'm a Coco Jr. and youth member of youth organization Good Kids Mad City. Um, I'm here to talk about my experience with the school closing in the city of Chicago. I was a sophomore in high school attending John Hope College Prep on the south side of Chicago, one of the four Inglewood schools that was set to close by Rahm Emanuel in the year of 2016 at the end of the school year. Um, um, the wonderful organization, Kenwood Oakland Community, um, helped all four high schools, including LSC chairs from each school, fight and um, talk to the appointed school board officials and Janet Jackson because I'm sorry, I didn't even know that I had muted myself. Um, so basically it was about us being served in justice in the city of Chicago trying to close Inglewood schools when you know a school in the North Side will never be closed. We were they were trying to close our school and blame it on us as the fact why they were closing our schools but they just didn't want to invest in all the resources that they needed to keep our school open and keep students coming back. It's not our fault that the school closed. You guys made this system. And the reason that kids are not coming is because it's you all's fault. So we fought a long, hard fight. We were at in front of Rom's house. We invaded city hall. We did train takeovers. We marched and protested until our voices were heard. And then the final decision was that they would not close the schools, that they would instead be fed. And at first I was saying that I didn't have any hopes in the um, new school, in the new Inglewood High School, but I know a lot of youth that go there now and I am happy and proud of them that they get to experience the school, you know, that has some equity in it now, even though it's still not fair because us black and brown schools on the South and West side are still not given the same equity as schools on the North side. Um, we spoke with teachers, I spoke with Chip Johnson, he used to work at my high school. And to see him being on a team that is opposing to close our school, or voting to close our school, it was like a slap in the face. And just seeing them laugh at our tears and just show no emotion, it was showing that if you're an educator, I'm, I'm not seeing that you really care about us black and brown youth on the south and west sides of Chicago. So I was a student that had to place, face the school closing and end up being displaced. But I didn't let that stop me, and I still made hope at my new school and still was successful at my new school. So that's the truth. Us black and brown students on the south and west sides are not being treated as equal as a school on the north side. And as I have said before, a school on the north side will never face a closing. They will get all the funding they need. They don't have to fight about the things they need. They don't have to talk and chant and rant to officials. They can just get it. We do. We have to beg and plead and tell them why we deserve it. And I think that's totally unfair because we don't. And we should have to be doing all this extra to prove that we worth it. And that's it. All right, Miss Miracle. Appreciate it, sister. Appreciate that. Um, next, we're going to have a um, leader of an organization that has been a powerhouse in education reform. For the last 20, 30 years. Um, Ms. Juliet De, De Jesus Alejandre from Logos Square Neighborhood Association. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, from LSNA, I'm a CPS graduate. Hey, a mother of three boys. Um, and today, uh, I was with a group of women at LSNA. We spent the morning doing mutual aid work, um, and my heart is broken. Um, as we shared what we had, we kept hearing stories of loss of income, loss of health, um, and the devastating loss of loved ones. Um, by 11 o'clock, I had to stop and cry and just allow myself to feel the heartbreak and feel the pain. I didn't wanna push it away because if I numb myself to my community's grief, then I know I'm also cutting myself from my community's joy, my community's brilliance, my community's vision and solutions. 
Um, and this is what it means to be a community, right? To share it all. Um, and I find I have found myself over the years wishing over and over again that the mayor and the board of education and the top brass of CPS would listen to the heartbreak and the joy of our children and our families, because that's where the brilliance and the solutions come from. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kelvin Park High School, who now is finally rebuilding after a decade of budget cuts totaling over $10 million, the loss of a thousand students and 10 different administrators. A group of youth organizers starting 10 years ago, mothers, teachers, met with CPS administrators, one administration after the other. We presented a plan um, um, after meeting with community members in a church basement for weeks. And all of that loss could have been avoided if CPS had taken seriously our community plan that included the arts and restorative justice and curriculum that honored the Latino and Latina heritage of our community. And I'm happy that finally, after so many years of struggle, that Kelvin Park High School is beginning to recover so much that has been lost. Go KP Panthers, I'm forever, forever cheering for you. So this summer, um, a group of our youth leaders and our parent mentors um, wrote the, a, a plan for remote learning, reimagine remote learning. Um, these leaders spoke, they speak to hundreds of, of families and young people, right, every week, because we're also working on affordable housing and immigrant rights and reimagining public safety. And based on what they heard from people, they implored CPS to radically center relationships to allow for teachers and students to make caring for themselves and their families the core of the curriculum. Our mamas and our young people called for universal income so that essential workers like them could stay home and stop the spread. We asked for CPS and the mayor to allow the heartbreak of our city to be at the center of their decisions. And instead we have what we have right now. So I want, to, I want to elect a school board member who had an IEP all their lives growing up and that they'll fight for my babies, right, who have IEPs to receive every minute of their specialized service. I want a school board member who knows what it feels like to go to school with metal detectors, but no college coach. Because I know that their heart break, will, their heart will break like mine and they will listen to the beautiful solutions that come from that heartbreak. So thank you. Thank you all for this fight. Um, we're going to have that. I know we're going to have it. Thank you, Julia. Appreciate that. So now we get to what you can do. So the process, in order for a bill to become a law, we got to pass it out of both chambers of the Illinois General Assembly. That's the House of Representatives and the Senate. We've done half of that work. It's out of the House. So now we have to do is get it out of the Senate. So, but we got to make sure, and most things that happen in Springfield is done through the leadership of each chamber. So the Speaker of the House determines what happens in the House. The Senate president determines what happens in the, in the Senate. So we need people to, one, call your state senator. You don't need to call your reps. We've done that side, so we ain't got to focus there. But your state senator, call your state senator. Let them know that you support an elected school board and you want to see it pass during lame duck session. And, let, what, and lame duck session is the time between January 2nd and uh, the next time the General Assembly is going to get sworn in on the 13th. Uh, when they come together to pass whatever bills they can get done. It's called lame duck because for those who have not, who didn't win in November, this is their last little chance to, you know, make any votes before they get sworn out. So, and if we don't pass it in lame duck session before a new general assembly is sworn in, we have to start all over. That's why it's imperative that we have a full court press right now. You got to call your state senator, force them to commit to you that they're going to call the senator, they're going to call the Senate president, uh, their president, um, Don Harmon, and tell him they want it done. They want to pass the Liquor School Board HB 2267 to get a vote during the lame duck session. Not only are you going to call your senator, you need to call the Senate president himself, Don Harmon. I think we have those numbers listed in the chat. Call him yourself. He needs to feel pressure. Right now, Larry, uh, Lori Lightfoot is making calls to stop this. So they need to fear us more than they fear her. And right now, some senators are, part, are starting to pull back. Some of the Black senators are like, I don't know. No, we got to do a full court press. We got to make sure that they are not comfortable not doing this. 
If we ain't did that, we ain't did our job. Our job is to show them how to represent us. It's their job to do it. So now is the time for us to do our job. So there is also a link where you can, um, uh, I think the CTU set up a, a link where you can go in and put your address and then it'll send a letter out to your state senator and to your, and to Don Harmon. You need to do that as well. So send a letter, you know, go to that link, put your address in, let those letters go out, but also make those calls and call them again and talk to some of your neighbors and have them call. There is not, there's no, not, there's nothing little we can do on this. The more we do, the better chance we got to move in this. All right. So again, it's in the Senate now. We got to move it out the Senate and we got to the 13th of January to do it. So the next time they come together in January, they got to make this a priority. They don't do that. We start all over come January 14th. And that's not what we want. So we got to put as much pressure on Don Harmon, who's the Senate president, who can control what bills are, are called and when they call, and also make sure your Senate, your state senator is on board with this and they're putting pressure on this too. Is that simple enough? Oh, well, I made it simple. And it ain't difficult, it's easy, right? If it ain't, if it ain't simple, it ain't right. So it's a simple thing, but now's the time for us to do our work though. We got to do our work now. Now with that, we can open up for any questions that people may have. And I'm not, I think, Janan, are you fielding questions out the chat or how are we doing it? Yeah, or if people want to raise their hand, we can, you know, someone could bring them over. Yeah. Yeah, I think we already have a few questions lined up. I believe there is a Hisu Estrada. I'm going to put, I'm going to patch you in and then you're going to ask your question. Nice. Appreciate that. Can you see me or hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. Thanks. I didn't realize I was going to speak. Ooh. Hey, I just want to say thank you so, so much. This was just amazing. And I wish more people had come. We just lovely. Thank you. So since the city colleges of Chicago, which I am a faculty member of also has an appointed board by the mayor, mm. shouldn't there be legislation to make the board for the city colleges elected as well? Doesn't the city colleges need the same accountability as CPS? especially in light of the fact that historically and currently the city colleges board has made ill thought often racist decisions that worked against the interests of our underrepresented working class students from diverse communities. It's been horrible. So what do you think about that? All right. Um, um, Rod, right. I could, I could take that one if that's all right. Um, and, and so thank you for your question. Um, and the answer is an emphatic yes. Um, so, while it certainly hasn't gained um, the same level of uh, media attention as the elected school board for the Chicago Public Schools, um, I believe either the first year that I filed the bill for that I that I was privileged to take over the the sponsorship of the bill for CPS, or the second year after that, um, I also filed a complimentary bill to create an elected board for. Uh, the Chicago uh, City Colleges. Uh, that is, as you mentioned, the only, just like CPS is the only uh, unelected board in the state uh, for K through 12, Chicago City Colleges is the only unelected community college board uh, in the state. So um, you, you are absolutely right. And it is a, a, um, a parallel fight. I see Tony Johnson here, who has a, been a champion fighting for uh, an elected board for CPS, as well as uh, making sure that we're pushing through uh, the same fight for the city colleges. So yeah, we're on. Yeah, and I thank you. Um, you have been amazing. And I just, I pray for you really do in this hard battle you have ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, next question. Wonderful, we have an April Harris who has their hand up. So I'm gonna allow them to speak. I'm April? sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, go for it. Oh, thank you so much. God bless you guys, by the way. Um, I'm with the, I have, a, I have a few concerns about the students who are experiencing homeless, especially mm. during the pandemic. Um, currently CPS is reporting that the numbers of homeless students are going down. We mm. know that homelessness is increasing now during these terrible economic times. Mm. I feel they are not doing an adequate job identifying students since remote learning has started. 
So those students will not be getting the supports they need. Mm. Also, students are experiencing a lot of difficulties with remote learning with the Chromebooks and the Wi-Fi hotspots are not working sometimes. Mm -hmm. It is already really difficult to learn when you are in a shelter or doubled up. Um, and this makes it harder. CPS should have been, I, I will, I guess what I'm trying to say is CPS, CPS should have been having someone reach out to all the families to check in and make sure they were not experiencing any difficulties before the problem started. This would have been the right thing to do. I feel with the yeah. money, and I also feel with the money that the schools are spending on police, uh, on police in schools, I think it was over like $30 million. They could be buying brand new Chromebooks and tablets for students to use. The school and also the school board right now, it it, it irritates me because my I have two kids that are in CPS schools, and my one child has an IEP. Mm. And I remember I had to go in front of the school board when I first moved here in 2014 for safety reasons from another state. And the school board told me we can't give your son the IEP that you want because of his temper tantrum. And I stormed in there and I wasn't belligerent, but I basically showed him, I gave him a stack of paperwork on his temper tantrums. And um, I basically told him my son needs help and I'm not gonna have him fall through the cracks. And I fought for my son's IEP and I finally got the IEP that I wanted for my son. And I feel that the school board is made up of people who have no educational background. I get that you used to be the CEO of BMO Harris Bank, but this is not a Fortune 500 company. This is a edu this is a institute of learning. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, I, and I think, and I appreciate that, April. I really do. And I think that speaks to why we need an elected school board because yes. voices like yours, Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, who have been champions on the rights of homeless youth, uh, are need will be would force an elected school board to be responsive to those needs. Whereas right now, uh, uh, an appointed school board can ignore those needs and fudge numbers and give whatever reports. But if someone who has whose job is determined on how they uh, handle constituent services, how they are responsive to the public, that changes what you get out of them. That changes. Right. That, so you are, you are hitting the nail on the head. That's why we need an elected. So thank you, Abel, for bringing that I just up. want to say I think you guys are doing an amazing job and just keep up the great fight. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And God bless you guys. All right. Who else? Who else we got next? Thank you, April. We had a, a question in the chat from Miss Bobby Brown. Let me put I'll recopy it again, which is I would like to ask the mayor. She said she supported an elected school board, but then she helped derail it. What is she going to do now, and how do we hold her accountable? And then I'm going to call on uh, Sal after. And I think um, we're saying what we have to do now. I mean, the mayor, the mayor is like any other, you know, person who, and I said just a politician who said what she had to say to get in office, and now we can see what is she doing. You know, so is she really representing the people that she claimed? Well, what, what was her slogan? Where's the light? There is no light here. We can see. So we we she's going to be who she is what we have to focus on now is what do we do what do we do right now and i think that's the most important thing because we got to move that senate and we hold her accountable in 2023 and we don't have short memories you know i'm just saying that that's how we hold her accountable by making the list of things that she fell short on or she lied about or she told us she's going to do but that's that's right we're going to put that to the side right now we need to make sure every day between now and January 13th, we're waking up saying, what can I do today to get us an elected school board? What can I do? You know, you gotta put it on your, what can I do today to get an elected school board? That's how we win this thing. But everybody focusing on this every day and calling, you know, neighbors and calling your senator, calling Harmony, call them every day. But it, the, the, what we put into it is what we're gonna get out of it. So thank you. What's next on this? Thank you. Uh, we have Sal. Um, I'm going to put you on right now. Okay. Can you hear us, Al? Sal, the floor is open. Okay, we'll come back to Sal. We have Tom Tresser. The floor is open, Tom. 
Good evening, brothers and sisters. Uh, the Civic Lab is small, but we stand with you in your fight, in our fight for an elected school board. We want to suggest a possible connection to our campaign to abolish tax increment financing. Remember, TIFs stand for taking it from schools. And this is one of the tools that the system has used to bleed the black and brown communities over the decades. Right now, there's one and a half billion dollars of property taxes sitting in the TIF accounts. We call for that money to be released immediately for pressing needs in the black and brown communities that are suffering so much from COVID and other ills. But this is, if you do this, you'll hit the mayor and her allies where it hurts in the pocketbook. This is our money. It should be, it should be used for the communities, not to uh, destroy them. So um, we just put it out there and we're happy to, to uh, help in any way we can. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing at the Civic Lab on, you know, really helping folks understand the budget, how they're, that Chicago isn't really broke, and um, making sure that people folks understand tips and how they work and how, yeah, how every time your taxes are raised, that money that would normally go to those school district parks and all that don't go there, it goes into a pot. And so, right, that is how our schools, especially in low income areas, are being drained. And we're not seeing the development that's supposed to be, that's supposed to be promised from that. So thank you. Who's next? Sal? The floor is open. If you're back on, Sal Etanello. Hey Sal, can you hear us? All right. Looks like we're having a few more technical issues with Sal. Um, Jeff Jenkins is up. Okay. Jeff, the floor is open. Great, thanks, Shannon. Um, this is a, a question for Senator Martwick. Uh, first of all, I appreciate your commitment to the uh, elected school board bill. I think you're genuine in your actions, clearly. Um, uh, I've been in this fight for over a decade now, and I have to say, I, I don't believe that most of our Democratic uh, elected officials, uh, particularly in Springfield, are genuine. I think they do just enough to secure our votes and very little when it comes to actually getting a, a bill passed. The reality is we have super majorities. When I say we, I mean the Democrats. You guys passed the cannabis bill in 48 hours wearing masks. You, uh, uh, excuse me, a casino bill in Chicago. Casino you bill. passed a, a cannabis bill. Um, there's been a windfall for the politically connected. Um, if, if you guys want to pass an elected school board bill, you have the votes. You have a super majority. And the reality is nothing, no, nothing is, is called. The bill is not called in session in Springfield, particularly lame duck session, without the votes already being counted. Senator Harmon knows exactly uh, what he has in terms of votes. So I, I would just ask you to you know, be honest with us and tell us before we, we do more work during these challenging times, is the bill gonna be called? Are the votes there? And if not, who's not gonna push this bill through so we can target them with a the primary challenge? Um, well, Jeff, I appreciate your, uh, um, your confidence in me and I, I do appreciate um, uh, your, your <laughs> frankness. Um, so what can I tell you? Um, I made it very clear um, to Senator Cullerton, President Cullerton, and now President Harmon, that um, this was my priority, that when I came to the Senate, that this was the most important thing to me, that this bill get passed. Everyone knows, and, and trust me, if everyone knows that this bill has taken too long, you can imagine it weighs down on me, right? Um, it, it weighs down on me uh, because I feel like when I was brought in um, long after this movement started and um, was given the opportunity to carry this legislation, I felt like that it was a great opportunity for me to get the ball across the finish line. And what it seems like to stick with my analogy is that I keep getting it to the five yard line and I just can't punch it across the goal line. And it has created a great deal of frustration for me. So when the time came for me to move to the Senate, when the time came for a new president, I made it very, 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 very clear that this is my priority. Um, that being said, I, I can't control this process. You know, um, our, our process in the General Assembly is an elected process. We elect leaders uh, to make those decisions. And 
and that is why you know Rod and and G two are and everyone here is encouraging you to reach out to your legislators because it remains a democratic process. So if those senators in the Senate, and we have some great champions there, right? We do. Uh, Senator Omar Aquino, Senator Robert Peters, Senator Ron Villarreal, Senator uh, Celia Villanueva, Senator Jackie Collins. Um, uh, these are all great champions for the selected school board member, but we got to get everybody else on board on this too. And so that's why we want you to reach out to your senators, reinforce to them the importance. And like you said, look, let them know this is your, this is democracy. If you don't vote for this, I get to vote for you, right? That, that's, that's fair game. And uh, call the president too. And Rod, I'm going to add one to this, right? Because if we, if we are lucky enough to get this across the finish line, uh, <clears throat> it's not a law until the big guy signs it, right? So um, since we're dealing with a very short runway, I'm gonna encourage everyone here to reach out to your senators, to reach out to President Hunterman. And I assure you, I, I talk to him all the time. And every time I talk to him, I remind him, Don, remember, this is my number one priority. Um, but let's reach out to the governor because if we can get this bill through the Senate, we need him to be waiting with the pen in his hand ready to sign, okay? So, um, so Jeff, thank you. I don't know if that answers your question uh, sufficiently. Like I said, I, I, I can't control what my leadership does, um, but I do believe that they, they hear me and I think that they will hear you. And I, I think that if we can get together in Springfield, I think this bill will go up on the board for a vote. And I think then if we've done our work, it will pass. Thanks, Senator Marwick, and thanks, Jeff, for your for your call um, for your question. Um, again, we wanted this we didn't want this to be a long um, uh, town hall. We wanted to make sure we came in, hit it, went, went through it. Um, but to Jeff's point, we need to get that vote call together. This is this is part of us getting together by us calling our state senators and telling them how we want them to represent us and them committing to that. And also in getting and lining up those votes, if we could move Harmon to support this, that lines up some of those senators as well. So it's, it's we're working both angles here. And so, yeah, so, but, but again, I challenge everybody from now to January 13th, every day you wake up, ask yourself, what can I do today to make sure we get an elected school board in Chicago. And so if we all are doing that, I think we'll get we'll get this ball across the finish line. Um, with that, I wanna thank everyone, thank all our speakers, thank all the participants. Um, remember, there's a, uh, the link to, you can go in and uh, type your address in and send a letter out. Make sure you, uh, you're calling your state senator, call him several times, him or her several times, and call Harmon several times. There's, there's not too little you can do you know, and there's never too much you can do. So keep, keep, keep at it. Um, and I want to just thank everybody. So, and be, and be on the lookout too, as well for the next things that we have going on. Cause again, like G2 said, we got to fight and organize and we have to fight for what we want. So there may be some direct actions we may start doing or whatever, just again, to make sure we get this thing done. We can't take anything off the table at this point uh, unless we want to concede defeat. And, that, and that's not who we are and that's not what we want. All right. That's right. So with that, and thank I, you. All. Thanks, Senator Mark. Yeah, Go if ahead. I could just say, I just want to say a thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I've seen a bunch of people popping up here, and I know how much so many people have done. I see Eric Clark on here with uh, Parents for Teachers. Um, I saw Mark on here. I see, um, I'm just looking around. I know there's some some folks from Raise Your Hand are here. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody from uh, Brighton Park is here. Um, I know... Uh, uh, LSNA is here, and all of these uh, coalitions of, of, of organizations that have fought so hard uh, for this issue for so many years. Um, it, it has been such a pleasure to work with you and to work for you, and I assure you it is, it is my mission to get this bill passed. I'm doing everything I can, but it, it is because of the great leadership of these people, not the least of which, of course, I saved the best for last, Rod and G2, the work that you guys have put into this, the leadership that you've shown, the organizing, getting people fired up and, and making them understand the importance of this issue is what's put me in a position 
to be the guy to carry this bill to its finish. And, and I, 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 that, that, that's not lost on me. So thank you for everything you've done. And thank you for the opportunity to come join you here tonight. All right. Thank you all. And be on the lookout. Make sure you get those letters in. Call your state senator. And every day, what can I do to make sure we get an elected school board in Chicago? All right. Thank you all. Have, enjoy the rest of the evening.